I, I, I would first, sorry, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> um, but I would like to start with three poll questions to get to know today's participants. Um, Cindy, are you able to help me launch those? Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, oops, got it. I guess I better do the got it part. Okay, so we'll start um, on the first poll question, um, which is, have you seen a presentation on It's Not Right for Neighbors, Friends and Families for Older Adults? And we'll give you 10 seconds to click on um, if you're able. Oh, we've got quite a, a good mixture here of, oh, did we put all three up, Cindy? Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Sorry, I didn't, I, I, I'll just click to get all three up just so, sorry, I didn't know how they would work there. So I give you a little bit more than 10 seconds as there's three questions to answer, sorry about that. <laughs> And Cindy, when you feel it's ready, we can end the poll when we've got as many answers as we can. Yeah, I'll give everyone five more seconds. I think we have one more person left. Okay, ending the poll now and sharing results. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, so, okay, we don't have a lot of people that have seen it, um, that's okay. Um, you know, we'll be giving you a, a good overview, I think, today. And I, and I think really we want to, um, as we see, there's quite a few people that, that uh, might have somebody that they know um, in, their, in their life um, and also people that are providers that are, are doing that. So um, I think this will be a really good conversation for us as we go through of how to talk um, about some of the things that we're seeing and, and a way to approach that. So um, we can go ahead and start. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing that, Cindy? I can do it. Oh, yeah, sorry. I've stopped sharing it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we will go on to the um, to our actual presentation. So everyone has the right to be safe and free from abuse or neglect. No one should experience abuse. We have a shared responsibility to re promote respect for all members of our society. The It's Not Right presentation was developed by Western Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children to engage a wide variety of audiences in discussion and practice on how neighbors, friends, family members, and community can learn to recognize and respond to warning signs of abuse and neglect in the lives of older adults they know. The program is designed to educate people who are close to ad older adults and how to engage them in a supportive way. The emphasis is on engaging people from all walks of life and in all parts of the country to say, to, so that they see themselves as having a vital role to play in creating a peaceful, respective, respectful and supportive society. To recognize the warning signs and then to take small and practical steps to help that are safe and respectful. We will not be presenting the full It's Not Right presentation as I remember, as I mentioned, but focusing on having the conversation with an older adult and what supports are available. I would like to start with a one minute, one, one minute banner video that I found on the Western Center for Research webpage. This shows some of the scenarios that have been developed for the INR pr presentation. I will go ahead and hopefully everybody can hear it. Better yet, report it. See what the cops can do about it. It's a problem we can ask my parents and your mother doesn't have to see your grandson at all. You want to spend time with your grandson, don't you? Well, I am sorry, but that is going too far. You still cater to his every whim when what he really needs is a swift kick in the pants. I can't. Come on, I know you cast your check yesterday. If there's anything that I can do to help, I'm here. We miss seeing you. You happy with the way things are? Your life has changed so much. Are you OK?
so in the full 90 minute uh, It's Not Right presentation, we define elder abuse and ageism. We give, oh, sorry, this is a little glitch on this system. <laughs> we give a list of warning signs, talk about risk factors and the imbal imbalance of power. In this 45 minute session, we want to focus on how to respond safely and supportively when you suspect or are working with an older adult who may be in an abusive situation. And again, if you have any questions or need clarification on some of the things we brief we will be briefly touching on, please raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Uh, like I said, we have Jane monitoring that and she can uh, make sure that we answer any questions that you have. So we define, uh, not we, but on uh, the Alberta Elder Abuse Awareness uh, Council webpage, uh, we define abuse as any action or inaction by a person's person or persons in a trusting relationship that causes harm and distress to an older adult. And of course, the most common forms of elder abuse include financial, emotional, physical, sexual neglect, and medication. And we define ageism as discrimination against older adults because they are older. We will also discuss resources and how to help them help find them in your community. So this is what we'll be doing, the respond safely and supportively. And the way that we respond supportively is by having a conversation with someone you are concerned about. We call it the see it, name it, check it. See it is the warning sign that says to you something isn't right. And, and we want you to trust your instincts on, on, on that when you see something. For the purpose of time, we want to focus on name it, which is approaching the person with care and concern and naming what you have seen or heard, and then check it by asking the person if they are okay, but don't assume you know what is happening. Next, we will show you a scenario and introduce you to Carla and her son, Michael, who is moving into Carla's home with his daughter. Watch for warning signs and things that make you feel uncomfortable and get your spidey senses tingling. Are you sure you're going to be comfortable in the basement? Yeah, there's plenty of room, Mom. Besides, your granddaughter will never be home. You're a lifesaver, Mom. I don't know what I would have done without you. I'm sure you're going to find another job in no time. Mm -hmm. Look at that. You mind if I watch a movie? By the way, your bank card was rejected at the gas station today. It was really embarrassing. What are you talking about? I went to fill up my car and it wouldn't go through. It must be overdrawn or something. You better hope your check comes in this week and you're not gonna be able to get your prescriptions refilled. What are you doing? I can't get used to the damp downstairs. Oh, try another blanket, Mom. We're boiling up here. You know, I would have wished you would have asked me before you moved me into the basement. Why do you have to be on my back, Mom? It's too dark and dingy down there. I get depressed, you know that. You play your puzzles down there as well as you can up here. <laughs> What's for dinner, Grams? I'm starving. So I, I wonder, I'd love for, to hear people's um, some comments about um, this video. And, and you know, when you, when you think of watching the signs, do you, do you feel like abuse is happening? Does anybody want to comment on? I think we can pretty much confirm that uh, there is some abuse happening there. Now it's, um, it's not quite, you know, a, um, physical at this point, but there is definitely some, um, some uh, stuff that Michael is doing that is not good. It, it makes you uncomfortable. He's taking over. Um, he's not 
um, he's sort of um, assuming that his his mom does not need um, she can be anywhere and he can do whatever he wants. Um, then you, yeah, you, you saw that he had taken her bank card, obviously, because he had been using it to get gas. Um, so those are some, some things that we think, eh, that's a bit, you know, and then talking about not being able to fill her subscriptions. And so that's a concerning thing because then that would affect her health. So there's lots of things that we want to, um, we want to, uh, sort of see us happening. Charlene, anything you want to add? From the chat box, we have medi uh, medi medication abuse um, and threats about moving her out. And we also see the financial abuse, emotional abuse. Um, yeah. The comments in the Yeah, absolutely. Those are a huge a financial and, and when you when you talk about the financial, that is actually um, the one thing that of uh, uh, that would be criminal. You know, he has no right to her bank card and just using her money uh, with really without her consent, um, because you can tell by her reaction that she didn't she didn't know um, what was happening with that. Sorry, Charlene, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Thanks for that. Some good suggestions there, and and I just wanted to mention that. Um, the warning signs also are um, obviously you can see some of the, the results of, the, of Michael's behaviors, but also looking at what some of the risk factors are uh, with regard to the situation too. And, and with Michael having moved in because of loss of employment, um, he has openly admitted that he has some issues with um, some mental health challenges, with depression. Um, so potentially that accelerating the problem as well and, and um, making the situation become um, bigger over time, uh, as well as some of the things going on with the, um, the granddaughter um, that, that we noticed there as well. Yeah, agreed, Charlene, when you think about, you know, he's seeing what his, how his dad is treating his mother, and so she's you know, that to her is now going to be normal, that that's okay to expect grandma to do everything um, and that they can just sit around and, and not contribute in any way. Um, and, you know, just uh, then taking that in and that's the behavior from now on. So, yeah. Anything else, Jane, that, in the chat box? Yeah, um, Marlene Gall said that the dampness can cause sickness uh, for her, for the mother. Yeah, and definitely in the fact that, you know, um, that the fact that Michael moved her without even asking her, um, you know, and then putting her in the fact that she is already feeling that, right? She's already too cold down there. And, and so that's a huge risk for mom as well. So thank you so much for, um, contributing there. Uh, so now we'll go. Oh, sorry. I'm, so <clears throat> now that we've talked about those warning signs, um, and some of the things that we've seen here, we now would like to introduce you to Carla's friend, Francesca. Watch Carla's body language when Francesca is trying to solve Carla's problems. Um, you will, you'll see it after how that affects the situation. So here we go. Let's, let's see. How are things going with your son being home? Oh, I feel badly for him. He's having such a hard time of it. He and his daughter moved upstairs on the weekend. And where does that leave you? In the spare room. In the basement? Oh, I am sorry, but that is going too far. You still cater to his every whim when what he really needs is a swift kick in the pants. If you don't put your foot down, he's never going to leave that couch. Never mind, look for a job. <clears throat> so that is a really a, a non-supportive response to what is happening with the situation and many people can understand Francesca's response we can acknowledge that it is un 
understandable to feel upset by what is happening and we want it to stop um, you know for her friend she cares about her friend but you can see the impact as Carla closes down um, and how do you see that you know if, if anybody has any any thoughts as to um, what how Carla's body language is and and what that means um, in this situation is she going to talk to oh Marlene go ahead Uh, yeah, you're echoing a little bit, but let's try it. So this is actually exactly what I'm dealing with for the clients. And um, the thing that uh, people don't realize is, or they forget, is no matter how annoying that child might be or what they're doing, that mother still loves that child so much that they're willing to overlook so much. And you have to be very delicate in the way you approach it. And my client actually lost her friend over it. And I just reminded the client that, um, in fact, um, I, I, I just acknowledged the fact that she loves her daughter so much. And she just started crying and said, thank, thank you for understanding that. Yeah, and, and Marlene, um, in case uh, people didn't hear, she's got a client that actually lost a friend over over this kind of you know where they weren't supportive and yeah absolutely you can tell by Carla's face she's going to defend her son she's not going to want people to think badly of him um and you know and and the situation because you know there's a little bit of um a shame too that you know her son is doing that but still it, Absolutely. It's so complicated when you think about, um, you know, a, a mom and her child and how she's going to always um, stick up for her child and not want people to think badly. So, um, yeah. And then the other thing that that we really want to be aware of is Fencha, by her response, she is actually blaming Carla for allowing the abuse to happen. Um, and blaming her for her son's behavior. And this is victim blaming. Um, and it happens a lot because we, you know, as a, as a person, we want to solve it and we want you to say, don't be ridiculous. This is not, um, this is not how your son should be acting. Like, give him a swift kick. Like, this is not right. And yeah, it's not right. But, um, you know, it, we can't be blaming Carla um, because it, it, it will. And like, uh, Marlene was saying it will um, it will ruin a friendship uh, of that it's not right to blame Carla for her son's behavior um, it's never the victim's fault and we want to really um, you know that's the key thing to to this um, but but I think we know that Fran Francesca generally cares about her friend and wants to help um, but if Francesca wants to be supportive Supportive. She has to change her response to open the door for Carla. So let's try that again. Let's see what Francesca, Francesca can do um, in this next scenario. How are things going with your son being home? Oh, I feel badly for him. He's having such a hard time of it. He and his daughter moved upstairs on the weekend. And where does that leave you? In the spare room. In the basement? I'm worried about you. Your life has changed so much. Are you OK? So here we see a very different um, response and you can see the difference in the body language. Um, and this is definitely what we wanna see it as a supportive response when you see something happening like this. Um, Francesca sees the disorder and asks the question. She shows genuine concern and names her concern. She sticks to the facts and uses non-judgmental language. She makes contact and asks a question, are you okay? 
which leaves the choice to Carla if she wants to talk about the situation. Francesca does one other thing, and I think one of the most important things, she interrupts the isolation. In most cases of abuse, without an interruption to the pattern or dynamic, it will escalate, increasing in frequency and or severity. As the abuse increases, so too does the isolation so that the person or people perpetrating the abuse and the person experiencing it become more and more alone in the situation. Interrupting the isolation is a key strategy to reducing and eliminating elder abuse. The see it, name it, check it conversation is the best way to approach a situation and the most important thing you can do, even if it's the only thing you can do. And that, that is hard. That is one of the hardest things, I think, is not to step in and um, do what you feel is the best for, for that person. It, it's, it is really hard. Um, and we can't emph emphasize that enough that it is the most difficult thing when you want to support somebody without, um, you know, I, um, alienating them in the process. Um, so we see the shift in the scenario from doing to responding. This means paying attention to the person you want to support. Learn to look for the impact of your words and approach. Are you opening the door for support or closing it? People's faces and body language will tell you a lot if you pay attention. What do you think will happen next? Will Carla confide in her friend? It seems possible. The door is open. Even if Carla does not go through the door, and she may not, Francesca can still feel good about trying and about leaving the door open. Things may happen in Carla's time, and that may take longer. Francesca should respect that. If she sees new warning signs, then she can do the see it, check it, or see it, name it, check it again, which we call the sink it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the best ways to just keep that conversation open. So what if Carla does disclose to Francesca? Now what? We want to definitely acknowledge um, and say, I'm sorry this happened to you. We always want to be that um, just some way to, to acknowledge what has happened. We want to listen and be supportive, encourage them to reach out for help. But we want to remember that it's not your responsibility to solve another's problems, another person's problems. There, there is a natural tendency of most people to solve or fix the problem for the other person, especially if you are a service provider and that is part of your job. Older adults who are being abused by someone they love becomes an incredibly complex situation. If they don't want to get help or change the situation, the best thing that you can do for that person is to be there and to support their decision, even if you don't agree. Trying to solve the situation can also be disrespectful because there is an assumption the person is not capable. And, and you know, we know that that is also um, something that just continues and, and um, it's a sort of a, abuse in itself is to not let that person, one thing we want them to do is make their own decisions. They have that right. Um, your continu continued support may be the only thing they have and don't get discouraged. Remember that you can also reach out for support if you are struggling to support someone who is in an abusive situation. Anybody have questions about that before we go on? Chantelle is going to kind of give us an update of what's available. So Chantelle, if you want to go ahead and uh, give us the Alberta Elder Abuse Awareness Council, a little bit of the background there, history. Um, hello, I actually oh, hello. have a question if you have time. Sure. Um, so uh, my name is Paul. I work with the Edmonton Zone AHS Home Care. Um, in our work, we frequently find that um, uh, the elders who are in these types of situations either, um, it, it's often not clear cut in terms of whether they have the capacity to make their own decisions. Um, or in some cases, of course, they may have an established alternate decision maker, but that established decision maker is actually um, the potential source of the abuse. 
Um, I recognize this is probably a very large question, but I was wondering um, what resources or steps you would suggest in those circumstances where we have questions about the ability of the older adult to cognitively make um, an appropriate choice you know, in this type of situation? How can we support our, our staff and families? That is a great question. Charlene, did you wanna, or, or Chantel, would you be able to give a bit of a uh, help with that? Um, I'm gonna let Chantel have a, have a go at that first. And then, um, because I think Chantel, um, as a, the chair of the, the Albert Elder Beast Awareness Council, I think that this is probably a question that's come up more than, <laughs> more than a number of times. Um, and I think that it's, it's a question that everyone always asks during these presentations or after. So Chantal, I'll, I'll let you have a, a go at this one. Sure, sounds good. Um, so capacity is always a question that we do get asked about. Um, where at all possible, even if the person has a decision maker in place, we would try to work with the person um, to understand their desire to make a report or to, to make a disclosure, how they wanted to proceed with the situation. If there is concern that abuse is happening and the person doesn't have the capacity to understand or and appreciate um, the consequences of making a decision, then we would probably start to try, we would suggest, I guess this would be what my suggestion would be, we would suggest to work with a doctor or a designated capacity assessor if the person doesn't have those documents created um, to identify if they can get a capacity assessment done to be able to determine that. Um, it's always a difficult area and because capacity is along that continuum um, to be able to fully understand it. But I guess when we when we have those concerns, if we can express them and really get a sense, first of all, whether or not the person has capacity or is lacking it, and then next, who has the ability to make those decisions, there's still sometimes options for your staff to be able to access support services that may not require making a report to police or making a report in through another mechanism um, that would support the older adult to get those services that they might need or to be able to work with those pieces without necessarily needing a decision maker in place. So um, it becomes a bit of a, a question around what the situation is in some of those pieces. Obviously where possible, we would wanna work with the decision maker or looking at whether or not we could get that capacity piece done so that we have a good determination, but where it is impossible, working with the older adult anyway to provide them with support services and to provide them um, with just that caring support to walk alongside them to be able to help them to feel like they can um, access support services to make the abuse stop or to um, make changes that might be able to impact that those would be some of the important pieces um, i feel like i might be missing something but charlene anything that you'd like to add on that from your perspective Thanks, Chantel. No, those are all really good suggestions. And Paul, I completely and absolutely understand the question that you have here because it's something that I think um, I, I struggle with quite often. And when, when we do these presentations uh, to community, it's a question that comes up a lot. I think one of the things that I've come to understand too is um, we want to help. We have to use the tools that are available to us as support workers, uh, tools such as within home care. And, and I don't mean to lump everybody together in the same category because I know things can work differently depending on where you work. But if you have access to an Alberta Health Services social worker that might be able to um, provide you some input and support that way or the, or the, the family involved. The other thing I tend to look at as well is taking a step back and um, trying to assess the harm level uh, um, and, and the intention of what you think might be abusive behavior happening. So obviously if the, the, the older adult that you think is being victimized is in, is in a high risk situation, that's gonna warrant a bigger response from somebody or, or certainly a conversation with somebody about. Um, so, so uh, just kind of getting to know the situation, asking some questions uh, without the, the um, suspected perpetrator in the room, if you can, 
the other thing is maybe you're not the maybe you're not the best person to actually ask the question. Maybe there's someone else that you can um, talk to about asking the question, like the doctor, um, because we don't. Those of us who actually see these situations, we might not be the best person to ask about the situation. So maybe there's someone else that's closer to the family or the or the the, the older adult. Um, I know that that's not a we always look for a very black and white, here are the steps to take to solve the problem, and there aren't any. And we were talking earlier before we all came on, uh, I was chatting with Amanda about, we have laws in place to remove children from abusive parents in situations like that, but we don't have laws in place that, that we can remove parents from abusive children. Um, we have laws in place that can help support our efforts to make that situation better, especially if there's criminal intent involved. But it's it's very complex. And the question that you've asked um, just really focus, sh shines more light on the complexity of the issue. So it's difficult um, taking the, the thought uh, and, and taking into consideration everything that Chantal has said and, that, and some really good strategies there. But just, um, yeah. Um, looking at risk factors, the level of risk, the level of danger, and trying to pull in uh, the people that you can for conversation. I know that that's not a black and white answer, but that's the best we have, all of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I, it's, I know it's a very complex question, um, and I wasn't expecting a black and white answer, but um, I think one of the things that I think both of you highlighted that's great feedback I can take back to staff as a, an educator in my zone is this idea that we it is unreasonable for us to expect that we are going to go into each situation and we are going to fix it um, and make the problem stop and go away. And um, I see that cause a lot of moral distress right in the staff. They want to help, they want to eliminate um, any abuse um, and it's challenging to support them but I think that you've said some great things that I can relay to staff in terms of that approach and how to think about what we're doing so thank you yeah thank you Paul and, and I think I always think about too um, you know the the older person themselves um, I was talking to um, a family member of a um, who has a mom that's been um, is being abused, and you know they've gone through the, the process and tried to fight, um, and it's just re, you know, it's almost like she said my mom is has PSTD now because she has been so traumatized by what her her family member has done, and so you know, we, we don't want to continue to re-traumatize either an older person who is going through this, this horrendous thing anyway, by, you know, then trying to solve it as well. We, we always have to consider um, the respect of that uh, older person. And it's, yeah, it's just, it's very frustrating for sure. Charlene? Thanks, Amanda. The, yeah, the other thing I just wanted to mention too, and one of the things that I love so much about the NFF program is that we're encouraged to also look at, um, are there some needs that the, um, the person who's perpetrating the, the abuse, are there some unmet needs there? Or are there some, some things that we can help support that person in? So sometimes, Sometimes if you can help the perpetrator, and I, and I hate using that term, but for, for the sake of conversation, if you can assist the person, uh, let's take Michael, for instance, he's got, some, he's got some things going on there. So can is there someone within your team or within the family network or someone who can have a conversation with Michael about what's going on with him? Because sometimes if you can remove those challenges that the per perpetrator has and, and get them unstuck, then that can relieve some of the abusive behaviors that the, um, that the elderly person is experiencing. So 
there to look at it from a broader lens, not just not just fixing what's going on with the older adult, but what other things, what other supports, what other conversations might safely be had within that family dynamic to make the situation better for the older adult. Yeah, that's a really good point, Charlene. And one of the things that we didn't mention, um, and I think when you, if you were to ask Michael in that scenario, if he thought he was being abusive, he would not think he was, right? So that is another good point that, um, because, you know, he just, he, he's entitled to his mom's money, he would think, and, you know, he's not, he's not being physically abusive to her. So that's the other thing too, I think, with working with uh, someone that p could be abusive is working um, just, you know, they might not even be aware of what they're doing. So that is a, a key thing, if, 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 if possible, is to, you know, really find out what is happening when, when it, it's somebody that is the abuser. So very, very good point, Charlene. Um, Chantal, did you, if, if there's no more questions, sorry, I'll just, before Chantal goes on <laughs> her to her part. Super, okay, Chantal. Take it away. Thanks. Um, so I just thought we would provide a little bit of the history of um, the Alberta Elder Abuse Awareness Council's work with the It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Family initiative. And so um, the initiative actually started in about 2009 out of Western University, and they actually initially did an It's Not Right um, Neighbors, Friends and Family for domestic violence. And then in 2012, they were successful in getting a New Horizons grant to actually create the It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Family for older adults version with the um, additional videos that they created and discussion guides and material. And so that actually launched in 2015. Um, and so Alberta was part of um, the CNPEA, which is the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. Um, and we heard about it through that because Pat was our representative, Pat Power, from the council to the CNPEA. And so um, we actually brought it to Alberta and we did a training for a group of service providers and launched the It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Family program. And in 2017, we decided that the council would take it on as an ongoing program. Um, it really aligns with a lot of the values that the council has as far as we see the value of training bystanders in this kind of um, discussion and really in pushing the key messages around everybody having a role to play within elder abuse. So I think that's the key for us in getting awareness um, across the province about what elder abuse is and how you can actually play a role in supporting an older adult who may be experiencing it. You don't have to be the expert. You don't have to know all the resources. You just have to know how to have that supportive conversation and come alongside and support them to get to the resources and supports that they need to connect with. So um, in 2017, then we started looking for additional funding dollars to be able to support the grant. Uh, we started a community of practice. Um, and we also did some additional development of different uh, materials with the council, including some print materials, some posters, uh, certificates, um, a whole bunch of different things. And in 2020, we did receive a grant that allowed us to be able to kind of um, continue and grow the initiative, do some additional training. Um, we have brought Margaret McPherson, who is the developer of the It's Not Right program, out a few times to do some training. And we continue to connect with her regarding updating of the, the program, as well as different training modules. Um, a couple of weeks ago, she just did one around capacity and, and caregiver training and things. Um, and in 2021, the Council launched the Staying Safe Handbook, which is a resource for older adults living in Alberta. And it's kind of a complementary piece um, to the program in that, again, it provides just another resource for older adults who may be looking for ways that they can access support services. It's a great way for family members and friends to be able to say to an older adult, you know, I'm really worried about you. This resource has some material about places we maybe want to think about connecting to. Um, and then just this year, we were able to secure funding from New Horizons for Seniors to do a bit more work with our It's Not Right material. In particular, we're looking at developing out discussion guides to be able to enhance our presentations with diverse rural and remote communities. 
Um, there are some great videos that have been developed, but often we don't use those videos quite as much because there isn't discussion guides that um, specifically go along with them to talk to different um, groups and communities who may be experiencing elder abuse, but it might look a little different or it might need to have a different uh, conversation around it when we're talking about intergenerational um, families, when we're talking about a systemic abuse, when we're talking about um, you know, places that are more rural and remote that don't have the same services, these discussions kind of need to be adapted to those particular settings. And so that's part of the work that we're hoping to do. We obviously continue to support um, the initiative by providing regular training and by um, allowing presenters to use our Zoom account. And we also provide small honorariums for presenters and trainers. Um, we have over COVID shifted to do some online and some still now again that it's opened up a bit more in person. And so um, there's a good blend and, and there's opportunities. We also have a map both on our website, the Alberta Elder Abuse Awareness website, where you can click on to find who presenters and trainers might be in your area. If you're interested in having a presentation, you can click and there's email addresses attached. Um, you can also reach out to the council to ask if there's somebody who maybe isn't on the map because we do have a list of people who aren't listed but still do presentations that we could connect you with in your area. Sometimes it's nice to have a local person um, be able to provide those so that there's connection to local resources. We also have some on uh, online options so that if you're joining us from anywhere in the province, you would be able to connect in and, and be part of a presentation. There's one coming up uh, June 28th with Charlene and a, a co-presenter of hers, Irene, who will be doing it online. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to the council or directly maybe to Charlene. Charlene, if you feel comfortable adding your contact information at the end, um, if you're interested in having that presentation provided to you through our online option. Um, and yeah, the council just really sees this this um, bystander training in this, it's not right, neighbors, friends and family, as such a key pillar in the work that we're doing because it is such a piece around engaging everybody, everybody can play a part in it. And it's really equipping people to feel comfortable with how do I have this conversation? Because I think often what we're faced with um, when we have a situation where it's like, oh my gosh, that doesn't feel right. But then we also feel like, well, I'm not the best person to handle this but you might be the best person if you're the one seeing it and can have that conversation about what you've seen, um, how, how it made you feel and checking in with the person to see how they're doing. It lets them know that you're there as a support and it opens the door to that conversation and they may choose to disclose or they might not, but it lets them know that somebody else is aware of things that are going on. And so as things move forward, if it changes for them or if they decide that they want to come forward, they may reach out to you or maybe they decide to go somewhere else for help. But I think it just starts to um, interrupt that isolation and let the person know, hey, I'm concerned about you and I'm here to support you. So um, the council is excited to be able to continue to do this work. And we're so grateful for our presenters and trainers across the province who are engaged and who see the value in this. And we're glad that you were able to join us today to learn more about this initiative as well. Um, our map to the side here, just so that you're aware of what that kind of represents, is our case managers. We have 16 case managers across the province who do direct case management with elder abuse. And this is kind of a representation of the area that they're covering um, in those different case management um, positions. So if you have an older adult and you are wanting to connect them to specific resources, case managers are a great resource. There's also the um, Provincial Family Violence Line, which is 310-1818. It's available 24-7, and it has um, over 250 different languages that it's available in, and they do know resources for elder abuse and would be able to connect people to that as well. Um, and if you're just not sure and you're, you're questioning about some of that, our case managers are really great as well about having just some of those wellness conversations to understand a bit more about what those... Um, what's going on in the situation and to determine a bit more about whether or not elder abuse is occurring or whether it's something else that might be happening and just kind of connecting people to resources. Um, so I think that's all that I had to share, but I hope that was of help. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them as well. Thank you, Chantal. Jane, is there anything in the chat box? Any questions? Uh, no, nothing at this time. Okay, thank you so much, Chantal. Um, yeah, I think um, I actually had um, given a case manager's um, name for somebody that um, 
we were talking about a, a family that that are the elder person is going through some abuse and um, I think too for especially if you've got a family member who is struggling with an, an older adult that they don't know where to turn um, and, and maybe they're doing all the right things but they're not sure um, and that's another I think a great um, way to connect with the case managers just to make sure are they are they really doing the right thing? Maybe they're a little bit unsure and they're so frustrated. And so I think a case manager is a great sounding board as to say, you know what, that is, that is the right thing. And, you know, these are the steps that I would take. So I, I really think that's a great um, resource for sure. Um, and the, our next, um, I won't click over, um, as Chantal had mentioned, um, the family violence info line, um, there's also the distress center, which is, these are the two 24 hour um, phone lines that, um, that would, you know, put you into starting that conversation as to some resources available. Um, there's also in most um, of the communities, uh, there is also a local FCSS office. Um, and they're also a good resource of um, some, or a good start of, of some available resources to start that conversation. Um, we also sometimes, especially if there's um, police involved or the RCMP, the victim services is also a great resource as to, um, you know, where to start, especially, you know, as, as the victim, it, they will, you know, support that, that person that's gone through. Um, so that's a great, great resource as well. And the other thing that I just, I mentioned is local seniors organizations. Um, and I don't necessarily mean as, you know, somewhere where they can find help, but it would be a great to connect a senior uh, so that they have some support from other seniors. And um, in our area, especially, um, they have actually seen some cases and have been able to support um, because they've seen the difference that a senior, you know, if they've been there a while, they, they see some differences in their maybe their appearance or bruises or just even in their mannerisms or, or um, how they've changed from a bubbly uh, person to a very quiet. So um, they're also a great support, um, even of just getting a senior out of in isolation so that they, they've, they've got somewhere to go and then they may be able to speak to um, somebody that's, you know, maybe not in the same boat, but just that as a, a person that, you know, is going through some of the things that they're going through as, as we all are going to be aging. So uh, we've also put, um, and I, I, Cindy, if you wouldn't mind putting the elder abuse, get help, um, there's a list of resources and, and the list of helplines as well. Um, also the Al Alberta elder abuse.ca um, website for those resources in your area that Chantal mentioned. Um, and also email info at Alberta elder abuse.ca if you want to learn more or if there's, um, you know, just, just check it out, see what, if, especially for I, uh, a caseworker. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Um, and then, of course, as Chantal mentioned, if you're interested in booking a presentation or learning more, um, you're welcome to email as well, and they can connect you with um, somebody in your area, if that's the case, or an online presentation. So is there any other questions? Um, Jane, any, anything else that, that you want to mention? No, I'm I'm pretty good with the way it's gone. Okay, perfect. Nobody in the chat box. So. Super, thank you. Any any questions that anybody wants to answer or ask about uh, what we've done so far here? We're pretty much at the end. Um, so you're welcome to any last questions. I know we're quite, quite early. Um, Chantal or Charlene, sorry. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I just wanted to mention um, that uh, June 15th, every year is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And so we're making attempts. Um, the council has done an amazing job. There's lots of resources on their webpage to uh, help grow the conversation about elder abuse. 
And the It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Family program really is a great way to bring that conversation to community. I know we have a number of service providers here on, on the call today, um, and, and that's wonderful. But I would also invite you as a service provider to take that hat off from time to time and be a community member as well and look for people, older people in your community around you, maybe older relatives, that you can use these strategies as well to initiate um, safe and respectful conversation around what you're seeing might be abusive behaviors being, um, that they're being victimized by. So again, what Chantal said, that this program really is meant to, to give bystanders tools to, uh, to respectfully initiate conversation uh, safely with someone who might be in a bad situation. Um, and that really is, I think, key. It's not about looking at something and, and, and jumping in and solving the problem. It's about break interrupting that, iso that isolation that Amanda had mentioned, interrupting that isolation that that senior might be feeling or the isolation of the situation in general, um, and just triggering a conversation, this is what I'm seeing, are you okay? You might be the only person that ever has that conversation or initiates that conversation with that person. Um, and it really could make a huge difference. Uh, I know whenever I do this presentation, and I think I can speak for Irene as well, who joins me um, when we do these presentations virtually, they, that I don't think that we've ever done one that hasn't resulted in a disclosure by someone saying, this is what I'm seeing, something happening, or this is happening to me. So it is an important conversation and we hope that the council and we support the council in growing that conversation in the community. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Yeah, and I think too that what we would like to do with this, the, the growing the conversation is just so that, um, you know, it, it, it's for that next generation as well uh, as to the respect and um, not to, to continue to sort of re, um, you know, from generations to generations to continue this, this behavior. Um, because sometimes it's, you know, a simple something that starts small. And uh, I know myself, what's, what started me into wanting to be part of this, this group was something that I had seen with my own grandma. And, you know, I just, my thinking when I was seeing it happen was that that's just not right. Like there, you know, and, and it, there, it, there was a change, um, but it was just the small little thing of not taking actually asking my grandmother what she wanted and sort of putting her in a situation which um, I felt was not the right situation for her. And it just, you know, it was just that awareness that you do need to ask, you know, that that older person, would you like to, you know, would you like to, to be moved to this? You know, would, is, this, is this the right thing for you? Um, and it's just such a small, small thing. And, um, and that, that, that's what was really started it for me. And then of course you see that there's, a, there's an ex escalation sometimes, and then there's some, some horrible um, situations that, that happen to people. And it's just, it's not right. It, we need to all be aware and all have a, a, a part of, of changing that so that no, nobody, not just older, an older adult, but nobody is abused in any way um, and made to feel like they're not part of our society. Um, and, and our older generation have, have such, you know, they've lived and had so much to give and continue to give that we, we never want to take that away from an older adult, that they are important um, as, as anybody in society. So that, that is really a big piece for me and why I think this is such a, a great program. Um, and, and there's been so much developed. Some of the um, immigrant service, uh, Calgary Immigrant Services Calgary has done some great things and, and other um, uh, areas in Edmonton and around the province for doing these, the translation, because, um, you know, this is also, um, at, uh, in, in any kind of um, society. And um, we want to make sure that we, we're bringing that to everyone in our, 
in Alberta. And they've also developed um, a translation of some of our, our these scenarios that we have. So, um, and, and that was worked with through Margaret McPherson from the uh, Western Center for Research. And so we're, we're moving that along to include everybody in, 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 in growing the conversation of what we want to see um, for, for all, all of, uh, members of society. So that, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, if we, is there any questions that, that you think th that we have not covered? I know we could talk and talk and we could give you more scenarios and, and more discussion on them. There, there's some great ones out there uh, of the different things um, that are happening. And yeah, there's just so much work to be done. But uh, thank you all for, for, for your participation. So we invite everyone to join the Core Alberta Abuse Group. And I, I think most of you are, so that's great. Uh, you can join the Core Platform platform for free and become a member. You can find many resources, events, and programs all around Alberta. Um, and Cindy, I'm sure you've added the web address in the chat. And when you join, you will be part of this community as we work together as a sector. We hope to see you on CORE. And if you have any questions or comments, please direct them to healthyaging at calgaryunitedway.org. Lastly, we will be sending out an email with a short survey that we hope you were able to take a few minutes to complete. We have also included the link in the chat if you wanted to fill out the survey right away. This will really help us gain insight on the event and how we, you felt participating today uh, and help us to develop it more so that we can have more conversations. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for joining today. Have a great day.